Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, sir. So, well, since everyone is here, we should get started. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seed that you plant. A very warm welcome to our esteemed guest speaker and all the founders and innovators gathered here for yet another fruitful Friday, the Masterclass Day. Gear up and be ready to understand the verticals of startup engagements with FPOs with the help of live case studies from the expert speaker. This is the fifth and the last session of Samunati Masterclass Series Phase 1, a five-week series aimed at assisting agri-tech and food-tech startups to become ready for the market. All new participants can watch the previous session streamed on Samunati's YouTube channel. I'm your host and moderator, Anupriya. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Now, I call upon Mr. B. Gopalakrishnan for the welcome address and contact setting. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, good evening, everyone, and uh, good evening, uh, Praveji, uh, for uh, accepting our uh, uh, invitation for uh, uh, speaking on this occasion. Let me introduce myself. My name is Gopalakrishnan. People call me BG. I'm the head of uh, startup initiative at uh, Samanathi Foundation. On behalf of Samanathi, I once again welcome everyone for the online Samanathi Masterclass series, a five-week series aimed at assisting agri-tech and food-tech startups to become ready for the market. Samanathi is an open agri network to unlock the trillion-dollar potential of the Indian, Indian agriculture with smallholder farmers at the center of it. Samanadi works closely with uh, agri-tech startups, providing both financial as well as non-financial solutions. Our pillar of engagement deeply focuses on founder development, market readiness, investment readiness, and the startups can continuously engage for more growth and support. As a part of our continuous engagement, we are hosting a Samanadi Masterclass series, a unique series of curated sessions for agri-tech startups with the theme of winging big with dreams. The purpose of the masterclass series is to provide curated seminars, panel discussions, and boot camps for agri-tech agri startups to gain knowledge, skills that can be applied to realize their true market potential. We are here to begin our fifth session by masterclass. Collectivization of producers especially the small and the marginal farmers into the producers organization has emerged as one of the most effective pathways to address the many challenges of agriculture, but most importantly, improved access to investment, technology, and in inputs and markets. As the saying goes, your network is your net worth. Farmers producers organization has emerged as an aggregator of farm produce and to link farmers directly to the market. Today's session, let us understand the nuances, then opportunities of the entire agri value chain from the expert, our expert, and looking forward for the sessions for uh, this particular masterclass. Over to Anu. Thank you, Mr. BG, sir. The following is the uh, the program agenda of the meeting will be guest address followed by closing remarks, Q&A and a vote of thanks. A goal is a dream with a deadline. All the dreamers and ever persistent entrepreneurs can use the Q&A box feature to register all your questions. Your questions will be answered by the end of the session. Now, it is time to welcome the guest speaker of the day. Without further ado, I would like to invite our most knowledgeable and experienced speaker, the director at Samunati, Mr. Pravesh Sharma, retired IAS, co-founder and CEO of Kamatan Farmtech Private Limited. Sir has sought voluntary retirement from IAS in 2016 after a career spanning 34 years to launch Sabjiwala, a new, a new model startup in fresh produce supply. Since March 2018, it is expanded to Kamatan platform with three dynamic partners working with farmers and farmer producer organizations to create farmer market linkage across all crops. He has served for five years as managing director at Small Farmers Agribusiness Consortium 2010 to 2015, 
Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India, and undertook a successful national campaign to mobilize farmers into producer organizations. He has served for over 20 years in Madhya Pradesh, posting as district magistrate in five districts and served for three years in prime minister's office. He is also a visiting fellow at Central Center of International Studies, Princeton, Univers uh, Princeton University, USA, researching food policies. Sir's current affiliations are visiting senior fellow, Indian Council of Ag Research on International, International Economic Relations, and advisor agriculture and food process processing to Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce, FICI, New Delhi, independent director DCM, Sriram Limited, New Delhi. Now I welcome sir to address the gathering. Welcome sir. Thank you Anupriya for your very kind words and uh, namaskar to all the participants. <clears throat> it's a great uh, privilege to be speaking to uh, such a huge audience. Uh, of, uh, shall I say, core supporters of the agri sector, because anybody who's willing to take out time at the end of the day to listen to some, you know, old fogey like me talk about agri issues. So there are only two reasons that you can do that. For Anupriya and BG, it's a compulsion since they are hosting this. But for the others, I, uh, number one, compliment you for your interest in agriculture and for understanding what are the opportunities specifically for startups in the FPO uh, ecosystem? If you could bring on um, <clears throat> a few slides which I have prepared to make this talk a little more bearable for you. Um, I don't want to uh, simply bore you with my voice, but I thought I'd put some um, interesting facts on the screen for you to absorb. And uh, hopefully that will trigger some questions during the session. And Opriya will keep a track and um, then I can look at, uh, if they're not too many, I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability before the end of the session. And what I really want to do before I, um, you know, talk very specifically on the theme of what are the business opportunities for FP, for startups in the FPO ecosystem, um, I think that my uh, unique contribution, if any, to this, uh, to this session would be to bring you some understanding of the larger ecosystem of agriculture in which agri startups are seeking to carve out a place. Um, when you go into a, let's say, unknown territory, you go into a jungle or you go into a desert or you simply set out on the road to go to a new destination, it's a good idea to understand that journey uh, through looking at a map or looking uh, to understand the landscape which you are about to enter. So I always make this point to any young or you know even older person who's interested in agriculture or trying to create a business opportunity uh, in the agri space. I always suggest that take some time to understand the larger context, understand the ecosystem, and then you will be able to identify the specific opportunity that lies uh, within that space. So I'm going to start initially by sharing with you a broad overview of my understanding of the agri sector, especially in the current uh, context. And then we can perhaps look at a few pointers on the opportunities that this setting uh, affords or provides to uh, interested or uh, innovative or entrepreneurial individuals or enterprises. So can we have the first slide, please? Anupriya, can you just move the slide? Uh, should I move to the next slide, sir? Yeah, please, please, next slide. Okay, so no, I think the previous one perhaps. Yeah, okay, just keep it there, keep it there, no problem. So I would like you to look at agriculture. Currently, many of you may be following the football World Cup in Qatar. Just like a football field is defined by a boundary, 
I would say the agricultural field today in India is defined by four corners. And these are the four corners that you see before you on the screen. And these four corners I call the four crises of agriculture. So what are these four crises? First and foremost, there is a serious income crisis in agriculture. Agriculture today is contributing only 17%, 17% of the national GDP. But it is employing 48% of the labor and close to 60% of the population is living in rural areas and is largely dependent on agriculture for its livelihoods. So there is a huge income crisis in that households who are trying to use agriculture as a source of livelihood are finding it increasingly difficult to balance their, you could say, budget. Okay. They are spending more on inputs than they are recovering from the output. So this is the first major issue that we have in agriculture, a serious income crisis. Now, subsumed in this is a whole lot of sub-crisis. We can't go into details. This is partly because of uh, badly op you know, operating markets, uh, inefficient price discovery, um, the uh, inability of producers, especially small producers, to be able to um, reach, uh, shall we say, the appropriate technologies. There are a huge number of issues, but for the macro sense, it's important to understand that agriculture is the first major issue that um, it is grappling with is, a, is an income crisis. And please, as I speak about these crises, some of you may also be looking at the opportunity in this crisis, because if there's a crisis, there is an opportunity to solve that crisis. So as I relate these four crises, um, I will try and link up when I you know, come to the second part of the presentation to the opportunities that lie within these crises. The second <clears throat> major crisis of agriculture today, or the second corner, like a football field, the first corner is the income crisis. The second corner is what I call the factor productivity crisis. What do we mean by a factor productivity? The factors of production of agriculture are obviously primarily land, water, labor, <clears throat> all three are in serious distress. Soil degradation, falling soil health, salinity, the uh, declining productivity of soils, all these are issues that you have been hearing about. But if you, if you concentrate on even one farm, um, at the level of one farm, all these crises converge to create a real macro crisis for the farmer. Water, 85% of our fresh water is going into agriculture. Uh, it's depriving both industry and urban areas of their fair share, but yet we are not getting enough value for that enormous amount of water that we are using, or some people say wasting. We are perhaps over investing in certain kinds of nutrients, especially nitrogen-based nutrients, which is also leading to declining soil productivity. So all this can be clubbed under the title of declining factor productivity, which is today, frankly, um, in a state of crisis. All of you, I'm sure, are, are aware of the increasing interest in sustainable agriculture, how it is linked to the you know, rapid changes in climate which are taking place, the onset of global warming. All of you, I'm sure, would recall that in February this year, we were looking at a bumper rubby wheat harvest in northern and central India. But in a matter of three weeks, an unseasonal spike in temperatures brought that harvest down by almost 9 to 10%. So India, which was planning to export large quantities of wheat to the world, our prime minister spoke at a global forum and said India will feed the world, yet the national government had to impose a ban on export of wheat because of a sudden change in weather leading to decline in the production. 
And this year, wheat prices have been unusually high compared to the previous three years. So this is one, uh, you could say, very dramatic effect of this declining factor product. The third crisis in agriculture is a human resource crisis. Now, this sounds counterintuitive because if you have a se sector where there is a surplus of population, how can there be a shortage of labor? But the truth is the younger generation in the villages is simply not interested in taking up agriculture as a preferred occupation. They would like to seek skills, education, and move out of the village. You will meet in metros like Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Chennai, you'll meet thousands of youngsters who are either working for Zomato or Amazon or simply you know, putting on some uniform and standing outside a building as a guard. And one simple question will tell you which is the district or village. Possibly most of them would be from Eastern India or Central India where agriculture is not able to support the kind of incomes to live a decent life. So they are simply migrating even with their low level of skills. So agriculture is facing a real crisis of human resources. And uh, it's questionable if we'll be able to sustain our current levels of production and productivity if the current trend of the migration of the youngsters from the villages uh, continues to take place. And the fourth crisis of agriculture is what I call the huge capital squeeze at the, uh, at the level of especially small and marginal farmers. Mm -hmm. So when I say capital squeeze, I mean the declining flows of formal institutional capital to agriculture for investment, for crop husbandry, for investment in machinery, for investment in farm uh, improvement, for, for investment in better technology, over the last decade and a half, this is anecdotal, uh, I'm sure, evidence which has already, you know, come across, you've come across in the newspapers or journals or in, you know, various debates or seminars. Banks, especially public sector banks, have closed down rural branches by the thousands. The penetration of the private sector banking in the rural sector, which was at one time assumed to have, you know, to be a sector of great opportunity that has simply not happened. New age uh, players like Samunati and like many other NBFCs and other players have tried to make up some of this slack, but they certainly cannot uh, compete with the reach of the banking sector. So overall, public sector resources into agriculture have fallen drastically over the last decade and a half. And um, basic uh, you know, economics suggests that it is public investment in agriculture that leads or crowds in private investment. So if there's a drop in public investment, there'll be a commensurate drop in private sector investment. Here we mean, when we say private sector, we of course talk about the farmer as the investor uh, in his own farm. So these are the four, I would say, corners of the agricultural field, which in a sense define the playing space. This is the space in which any agri startup, whether it's a Samunati or it's any one of you who are thinking about entering this domain, these are the four major factors or crises that you have to contend with. As I said, maybe I have only highlighted all the shortcomings, but I've done so deliberately because I hope that some of you can automatically see the opportunity or how you can enter this uh, field and maybe solve for some of these problems going ahead. So, uh, next slide, please, Anupriya. So I'm going to sum it up. Yeah, let's have the third one also. No, let's have all three. Okay. Be no, the last one, please. Yeah. So in agriculture, to sum up, I would say whether you are in India or you're in Africa or you're in America or in South Asia, Southeast Asia or China, there are three things that agriculture and agriculturists require. It's capital, it's access to markets, it's access to technology for continuously enhancing their productivity and resource use. Everything that anybody does, whether it is the government or the private sector, can be slotted under one of these three heads. 
no scheme, no agri startup, no agri business can operate outside this, I would say, triumvirate. This is the trinity of agriculture. And uh, any of you who are interested in uh, developing a business idea in agriculture needs to ask themselves the question, my enterprise is going, is going to solve the problem under which of these three heads? Or one of them, or two of them, or all three of them. Samanati seeks to solve uh, the problems of smallholders under each of these three pillars. But today I will not talk about Samanati because we'll try and take a bird's eye view of the sector. So this is the, this is the specific context of agriculture. I give you the macro context and this is the specific context. Next, please. Next slide, Arubia. Next slide. Sorry, can't hear you, Arubia. Uh, just a second, sir. Um, uh, it's taking a bit of time. You switch off your video and try. I'm trying. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's visible. Right, right. Um, I've uh, now brought this slide before you to help you get a comparative understanding of what are the huge barriers to entering the agri space as a business enterprise. And I've tried to compare the situation for enterprises in the industry and the services space. So the first column is if it was an industry, shall we say, based enterprise, what would be their experience in uh, accessing the key factors of production compared to services or agriculture? So this is just to you know, give you a realistic understanding of the challenges that you must be aware of and uh, that you must be prepared to address and be prepared to cope with. Um, one of the biggest, uh, you know, myths that's going around is that entry into the agri space uh, for a startup or for any business is actually the easiest compared to industry and services. And I would argue that actually this is a misrepresentation of the act, you know, real uh, of reality and of the real ground situation. Because if you just take these four factors, I've just chosen the four most important things that impact um, any enterprise, but most importantly, an agri-based enterprise. Um, let's start with land. Land for industry is a barrier, but at least there are policies to enable industrial enterprises from the smallest enterprise to the biggest enterprise through either some industrial estate or through some policy of conversion of agricultural land to industrial land in most of the major states. Um, for services, this is not a constraint at all because most services don't need, need land as one of the initial uh, inputs to kick off Services can be kicked off virtually. They can be set up in a higher premises. So land is not really a constraint, uh, an entry barrier for services. But for agriculture, especially if you are trying to set up, let's say, a food-based enterprise or uh, something which requires uh, land to set up infrastructure. It could be a warehouse. It could be a seed grading plant. It could simply be an input shop. It's a highly restricted area with major entry barriers. And this unfortunately is true across most of the Indian states. There are very few states which allow uh, an easy access, especially to a formal business enterprise. There are some activities that farmers can undertake, but even those are under very, very controlled conditions. If you look at a factor like labor, we know that in industry, 
there is a sense of labor looking for jobs, especially low skilled jobs. So the power of industry to bargain, shall we say low wages is very high because there is, there is more labor than there is employment in the industrial sector. So it's a buyer's market. In the services sector, since skills are not so important, there is certainly a wage advantage that services uh, or service-based enterprises enjoy because the entry barrier to, let's say, to onboard a, a, a worker in Amazon or in Zomato or in um, any other service-based enterprise, let's leave out the few high technology services. But for most of the services, entry level for labor is not a challenge. In the case of agriculture, there is a surplus, but skills are low. More importantly, mobility is low. Labor is concentrated in large pools in regions where in any case, agriculture enterprises are few, shall we say, Eastern India. Anything from central, from Eastern Madhya Pradesh to Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Jharkhand, Bihar, West Bengal, all the way into Assam. That's where the biggest pool of underemployed or unemployed agricultural labor is available. But where is the demand? Maybe it is in the plantations of Kerala. Maybe it is in the coffee plantations of Karnataka. Maybe it is the food enterprises of uh, Tamil Nadu or Andhra or Telangana. So there is a mismatch between the availability of cost-effective labor and the demand. This again becomes a huge uh, barrier for agri-based enterprises or agri-startups to get into a growth momentum. Let's come to capital. Again, in the industrial sector, you have dedicated financial institutions, you have dedicated um, channels, you have uh, policy policies designed over the last few decades where states are competing to offer subsidies to, to industrial enterprises. There is uh, foreign capital flowing into industry. So the entry barrier again for capital is very, very low. The same is the case for services. And today services are enjoying, I would say, a kind of a, a golden period where any good service-based idea is easily able to attract capital. But when you come to agriculture, this is one of the biggest challenges that any agri startup or any agri enterprise is facing. One, let's, without making any bones, I will say after six years of experience in the sector, the understanding of the majority of institutional investors. When I say institutional investors, I mean, not just venture capital funds. I mean, even, uh, you know, philanthropic foundations, banks, and other financial players, their understanding of agriculture is unfortunately compared to their understanding of industry or services, it's much lower. Therefore, their ability to appreciate an innovative idea or be able to see its expansion and growth is far more challenging. I uh, make this uh, you know, confession without any shame. I met over 100 investors. I'm not exaggerating. I have a list in my diary. In the first seven months of my uh, journey, I met more than 100 investors, including all the you know, top names, which I obviously will not name here. But I met every major investor uh, from the investing community. And I never raised even a rupee of capital. It's in my seventh month that I met our first investing partner who is still with us, who's still supporting us. But one of the things that I realized in that journey is that the understanding of agriculture and agri-related issues and also agri-related opportunities in the investing community is extremely low. And that's one of the reasons why agri startups compared to other startups are not able to raise the same volume uh, of capital and also with the same regularity. Lastly, I'll come to markets. Now for industry, 
if somebody is making this pen, if this pen is being made in India, it can be sold anywhere in the world. There is absolutely no barrier on a manufacturer based in India to sell a pen to anybody who's willing to pay that price anywhere in the world. The same is the case with services. Once you are clear about what your service offering is, you can actually offer it to anybody who's willing to pick it up for the price that you are you know, claiming. If that price suits the buyer, no issue. But in the case of agriculture, you have some of the most restricted markets in the world in our country. And that's a tragedy given the number of people in agriculture. All of you have heard about the Mandi system or what is called the APMC system, the Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee system. This is basically a legislative framework which uh, forces farmers in a particular region to bring their produce only to a designated market yard where there are certain licensed traders who are you know, given the option of uh, bidding for that produce. Um, enough has been written and you know, said about this. Many of you perhaps are aware of this yourself. Uh, this system has many constraints. It has certainly played a role in helping to, to sort of aggregate and create volumes from small, small fragmented holdings. But um, in many cases, it results in either monopsony, which means a single buyer, or a small group of buyers, uh, monopoly or monopsony, and market access then gets restricted. Large buyers are uh, not permitted in the majority of Indian states. Some people have made a breakthrough. Maharashtra has you know, some leeway to in some crops, you know, in all crops, but in the majority of states in India, direct access to the farmer is not allowed to bulk buyers. You have to go through the market system. So I thought that this would just help you appreciate the comparative um, challenges. Uh, if you are one of the, and I'm sure that those who have already uh, launched agri-based startups who may be part of this group, uh, you would be aware of many of these challenges, but I thought it would help to sort of reiterate and understand. I'm not suggesting that this is a reason for not attempting to address these issues or challenges and not finding innovative solutions. But as I said, a realistic understanding of the road ahead is very important when you set out on the journey. And this is simply an attempt to help you with this understanding. Next, please. Anupriya, next, please. Slide number five, yeah. Okay, so um, I don't want to, as I said, speak for too long because um, the idea is not to throw a huge number of facts at you, but I thought this, um, uh, and this is my second last slide, so I'll try and wind up in the next six to seven minutes so that we have enough time left for uh, discussion. Um, now, I, I'll, I'll speak about the specific context of uh, the FPO world and the opportunity it offers to build, you know, innovative and successful enterprises. Why did we, and I've been at this game for the last now 12 years, starting with my time in the government, and then I felt that I should, uh, you know, leave the government because the kind of work I wanted to do was not possible in government. But when we started thinking of this idea of the farmer collective, which we ultimately called farmer producer organizations or FPOs, it was again to address the very specific context of Indian agriculture. Now, you know, we have, and you know this perhaps uh, figure already, a country with 14 crore farm households where the average holding size is just 1.16 hectares. Okay, 1.16 hectares is barely three acres of land. Now, obviously reaching 14 crore households is an impossible task even for the government. I am sure that you are following the news stories that the PM 
Kisan Samman Yojana, which is supposed to uh, provide direct uh, you know, transfer of funds to farmers' accounts, at its peak, it could barely identify around 9 crore farm households. But over a period of time, they found there were duplications, there were ineligible people, and the last installment has been put out to barely 3 crore farm households. This is as per government data, which is out in the public domain. So I'm not suggesting that there are only 3 crore real farm households, but it tells us how challenging it is to reach these 14 crore farm households. So we realized that the combination of the huge numbers and no country in, in the world besides India has these numbers. China has moved enough people out of agriculture, so their numbers are now very manageable. So we have 14 crore farm households in agriculture. China today barely has three to four crore farm households in agriculture. You can see the difference. And the bad news is that this number is not going to significantly reduce in the next two decades. So even they are saying that by about 20, 40, 35 to 40, we may still have around 10 crore farm households, which is a huge number. Okay. The only way that you can address this challenge is by aggregation. Now, ideally, you should aggregate land to create large pools where you can deploy technology, capital in an efficient manner. But that's not going to happen in our country. Our country is a country dominated by smallholders. And we are going to remain with this low uh, palm size, but large numbers. So the only way that we are going to be able to address these households successfully and bring them capital, technology, and markets, remember my slide number two, if you want to solve those three challenges, we have to collectivize these farm households into a lesser number of what we call FPOs or any form of collective. I'm not suggesting only producer companies. It can be cooperatives. It can be any other form. I'm open to that. But a collective of at least 500 to 1,000 farmers is the bare minimum to be able to solve this challenge. The good news is that you know this whole idea has got roots. It is moving ahead. Lots of very good work done in many states. Maharashtra has done fantastic work. Also in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh, UP, let me tell you, has today more than uh, about 600 FPOs. So there is, there is uh, great uh, stuff happening there. And we currently have around 30,000 FPOs registered. The number is growing. Government of India has schemes. Every state government has some scheme. I won't go into all that. But what I'm trying to say is that this class of institution, this um, this animal, this uh, you know, category of institution, whatever you want to call it, this is going to be here with us at least for the next three to four decades. And we have barely scratched the surface of the opportunity of working with these institutions. Um, when I began, the whole model was how do we you know, convince market players to work with FPOs. That's been the core of my work. And now as part of the Samanati uh, group, I can say with pride that we have actually proved at scale, we have touched more than 3000 FPOs in the last three years of our work. Um, we have shown that they are a very reliable uh, set of uh, borrowers. Uh, they are a re very reliable set of suppliers. Um, they are a very reliable community to explore uh, new technologies. And now we are hoping to inaugurate the next phase. That's not the subject today, but I'll just give you a hint that in the next uh, six months, Samunati will be launching some very unique models for value addition with FPO. So there is a huge, huge opportunity um, in this space. Again, I would suggest that uh, the spread is not even. But actually, the biggest opportunities lie in Central, Eastern, and Northeastern India. Because these are markets which are currently underserved by all the three categories I spoke about. They have huge access to capital challenges, huge access to market challenges, and huge access to technology challenges. So 
there is huge headroom to grow. There is very, very, very low competition. There is a handful of players, barely in some cases, there are no players. In most of the Northeast, there is nobody who's willing to, uh, you know, enter those territories and look at the solutions that local producers are crying out for. But there is immense amount of high value product available. Do you know that Arunachal alone, Arunachal Pradesh alone produces more kiwi, kiwi fruit, which we import from New Zealand every year. Arunachal alone produces more kiwi every year than the total amount that is imported every year into India. We've been able to bring kiwi from New Zealand to India, but we've not been able to bring kiwi from Arunachal into our main markets. There is so much mandarin orange, which is a small variety of orange. All across the Northeast, in Meghalaya, in Nagaland, in Mizoram, in Arunachal, barely 5% of it makes it as far as Calcutta, Kolkata. The rest of it is simply either being sold at throwaway prices in the region. A lot of it is going to Bangladesh and some before things got disturbed in Myanmar, it was you know, going through Myanmar. So these are just examples. Um, I could spend the whole day talking about this, but I'm saying that it's very important to understand where the opportunity is. Um, and that links up to my other you know, point, which I made earlier, and I, which I want to repeat here. You must be clear, what is it that you're addressing and what problem are you solving? I have a great idea sitting in an office in Delhi or Bangalore or Mumbai. And I say, I'm going to you know, take this idea to the farmer. But the truth is the farmer may have a completely different set of problems. So you need to have, most importantly, a learning attitude if you're wanting to be a success as an agri-enterprise. Your solution has to be very context specific. There is perhaps nothing, maybe except, and even capital, the same product is not going to work everywhere. One of the reasons which attracted me to Samunati when I began, and Samunati was a you know, partner working alongside us, is that unlike a bank, when Samunati would go with us to an FPO, they would not say, here is a loan product we have. Uh, tell me, you know, do you want this or not? Rather, they would say, okay, what is your need for financing? What is your cycle of income? What would suit you in terms of affordability? And then they would custom design a loan product. And I'm very you know, impressed that even today when Samanati has grown, they become so big, they still follow this approach of customizing the financial solution to the needs of the customer. And I think that's, um, that's really one of the you know, biggest uh, reasons why they have succeeded. So, um, uh, so, so um, you need to have this approach that I have the desire to solve a problem, but I cannot devise the solution on my own. My solution has to be devised in partnership with my potential customer or client, whatever you want to call it. And the third aspect, as I written in the slide is, you have to be very agile and you have to be able to respond very quickly. So if you have these three things, a learning attitude, an ability to come up with context specific solutions and agility to respond, you're going to succeed. It doesn't matter how long it will take you. It doesn't matter where you succeed, but you're going to succeed. The last two points I want to make is um, agriculture is a sector which will remain technology enabled for at least another two decades. It won't be technology led. So what do I mean by this? You can launch a Zomato or a Swiggy or a phone pay. These are examples of technology led innovations. In agriculture, Technology will not lead a solution. Technology will enable solutions, of course. It can bring efficiency. It can help you with large data crunching if you require that. But don't expect an app to solve a problem. 
agriculture please always think of as a cow as a physical cow that's agriculture it needs to be fed three four times a day okay it needs to be milked at least twice a day it falls ill it produces something from the rear end which has to be taken care of otherwise you know you'll have other kinds of problems no technology can solve that problem without a human being present on the spot so can you help that human being address some of these problems a little more efficiently sure technology can be deployed there but the center of that enterprise will remain that cow right so let's let's be very clear that let's not believe that we can simply by developing a very perfect app or a technology we can solve somebody's problem we will have to solve it with a combination of a physical and maybe uh, some technology support lastly um, my advice to agri enterprises always is don't rush to create infrastructure be very capex and asset light once you have established your model and i even say this for people who are into the uh, food processing or food based enterprises if possible lease out a unit don't invest in it yourself up front if possible hire machinery don't buy it out immediately look for third party leasing models so there are lots of solutions but simply sinking a lot of money into capital assets is never a good idea in agriculture okay um in the next slide please close i'll i'll next one please uh, anupriya i'll share some very um high level lessons of my personal journey some of these may not be relevant to everybody but i thought that i'll uh, maybe close on a slightly personal note um and also make it a little more interesting for all of you um no not this one the the last one on priya please enter the agri business space and think of setting up an agri enterprise if you are absolutely at ease being at disease okay so this is a contradiction but if you are comfortable with being uncomfortable then agri business is the field for you there is nothing in agriculture that ever goes to plan the fao calls agriculture uh, and a farm enterprise a factory without a roof and it doesn't matter whether you're actually doing farming because an agri enterprise is also frankly a factory without a roof nothing that you will plan on an excel sheet or any business plan that you submitted to anybody will work out the way that you thought it would so the ability to uh, to to shall i say respond to the constantly changing uh, reality is an absolute must i have seen enterprises in the uh, service sector and certainly in the industrial sector where a business plan hardly deviated from its targets by 2 or 3% but in agri business that cannot be the norm and that's also one of the reasons why investors are so wary of investing in agri enterprises so that's one lesson that i learned the second is the best way to lose friends is for four friends to come together to set up an agri based enterprise now as you know many people coming out of colleges iits other institutions have you know put together very successful enterprises you read about them they are you know talking to you from the tv studios they are being interviewed in the newspapers and magazines but you will rarely have seen any similar example from the agri space so as i said um it's great to be hostel mates and you know conceptualize an idea in the canteen or the cafeteria or the dining hall but the reality of translating that into business on the ground is a very different so i would say that 
partnerships should always focus on what are the complementary skills or capabilities that are being brought on the table. Simply the ability to, uh, you know, be comfortable with each other should not be. And I'm, you know, obviously not going into specifics, but these are mistakes that I certainly made going ahead that you begin with people that you are comfortable with or familiar with, but that does, doesn't always make for the best business partners. Financing, whether by, you know, angels, VCs, in the end, you will feel everybody is the devil. Any, any enterprise uh, which has been through the um, blender of the fundraising journey will tell you that the expectations, the um, uh, pressures, the, shall we say, um, you know, taking the umbrella away when it starts to rain. So these experiences are common across the sector and you should go in with your eyes open. Um, you should assume that the other person is in the game as much for their self-interest as perhaps you are. You may be very motivated. You may be very, um, shall we say, um, uh, ambitious. You may want to make an impact, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the person or the end or the entity which is financing you will share your goals all the time. So be very clear when you are raising money, uh, how much of a convergence of interest the, you know, is there between the two of you. During COVID, we heard of the you know, funding flood. We heard of people who made presentations because everybody was working from home. So simply based on WhatsApp or Zoom uh, presentations, people raised money. But not all of them were able to sustain that, you know, when sort of sir, uh, the normality, normalcy re returned and uh, people, you know, went to the ground and found that the gap between the claim and the reality was too much. I've talked about technology already. Don't put over-reliance on technology, especially in agri. Maybe, as I said, it works uh, to a great extent in services. It works to a great extent in, obviously, uh, areas like uh, data management uh, and the rest, but for core problems of agriculture, again, I repeat, how do we solve for capital, for markets and for technology? Um, number five, I always say that the three most important words in the English language are, I don't know. Please take this as your mantra and start out with this approach that, I don't know about something, but I should never be embarrassed or ashamed to ask. You will, nobody can ever obviously, uh, you know, claim that they know everything about even a specific, uh, shall we say context, but the open attitude and I don't know, but I'm willing to ask uh, will take you a very, very long distance. And lastly, you must throw everything at what you are doing. So that's what I call engagement. But there is a difference between engagement and entanglement. Okay. Be completely engaged. Pour yourself into that idea, that enterprise. But don't be so involved that you can't, can't step back and can't walk away from it. Because believe me, there may be moments when you may actually have to walk away from it. We began with the Sabziwala brand name. Today we kill that brand. Because we realize that to build a bigger platform, we will have to give up our own individual identity. When Kamatan merged into Samunati, we willingly agreed to, you know, make Kamatan a sunset brand and build a Samunati brand because that was the more well-known brand. So uh, I'm still doing the same work which I was doing six years ago, but I have a much bigger platform. I have a much bigger uh, pool of colleagues to work with, and obviously. In the last uh, two years, we've been able to do much more than we were able to do, shall we say, on a smaller enterprise platform. So I'm going to stop here. I'm sorry if this is uh, somewhat disjointed, but um, I thought I'll try and speak very informally and uh, be very open with you. Um, and Anupriya, we can take some questions or some comments. Yes, or BG may like to say something. Uh, yes, sir. I think we have 15 more minutes. So you yes, please. Sir. Now Proceed to the next part yes, of the session. Thank you so much. Yes. For uh, thank you, Mr. Pravesh ji.
for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. So I'm sure that it was very helpful for the entrepreneurs to understand the FPO ecosystem from the very person whose brainchild was FPO and who was present all along throughout the journey of the success and implementing the concept in our country, sir. So a uh, gentle announcement for the participants. The participants who are present throughout the session will receive a participation certificate from Samunnati and at the end of the session, a feedback form will also be circulated. So please stay tuned. With that now, sir, the forum is open for Q&A. Uh, we can go ahead and take some questions. Uh, so can start the first question, sir. What are the opportunities for agri startups in transportation of fresh agri produce and in agriculture market, market committees? Sir, uh, should I repeat the question, sir? Sorry, um, where is the question? Um, so uh, the questions are in the Q&A box, sir. Okay, you want me to just go through them? Uh, I can read out the questions, sir, while you answer them. All right, okay. Maybe we can take the slide off and we can have the panel screen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. So the first question is, what are the opportunities for agri startups in transportation of fresh agri produce and in agriculture market committees? Um, definitely, this is one of the areas. So you're talking about logistics and um, there is obviously a huge amount of uh, inefficiency and wastage, especially in our post harvest uh, supply chain. Many, many enterprises, especially uh, operative in the fresh produce segment. So when I say fresh produce, I mean, uh, it could be horticulture produce, fruits and vegetables. It could be dairy products, milk and you know related products. Uh, it could be poultry products, eggs, meat, etc. cetera. Um, certainly there is a huge amount of opportunity in the post harvest management of produce. Um, in fact, I would say that uh, while you could look at, depending on your interest or your skill, you could look at um, any of these, how about simply solving for the very basic need of a near farm gate storage? Today, the bulk of our agri storage capacity exists at railheads or hubs where Transportation links are good. There are still large parts of this country. Again, this is true more of central and eastern India, where the nearest modern go down is anything between 30 to 100 kilometers away. We work in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Orissa very intensively with uh, now almost uh, 200 FPOs. And you'll be amazed that in 50% of these FPOs, the primary demand, if we talk about, okay, how do we help you scale the value added ladder? They simply say, help us build a go down. We want a modern go down where farmers can simply store for a month, not even for six months. They simply want a safe storage for a month or two while the price you know, of a commodity moves up you know, better than, shall we say, in the flush, the initial flush of the harvest season. So um, there are huge opportunities. There are some players, but compared to the demand, I would say we are not even 1%. We have not even met 1% of the demand. So certainly I would say this is a very, very promising area to get into. Yes, sir. Thank okay, you, let's, sir. Let's, let's not give Mr. Anonymous priority. We'll come back to Mr. Anonymous in there. Let's, the people who put their name, let's first address them. Let's go to Muthu Swami. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, Mathu Sama's question, the best and easiest way to construct any FPO is low land holding areas. So, that's the question he's asking. So, one uh, confusion many people have is that FPOs have to have members who own land. Please understand that legally, there is no requirement for a FPO member to be a land owner. A landless laborer a tenant farmer can also become a shareholder in an FPO. 
the only thing is that the gram panchayat or any other local authority has to certify that this person is a genuine agriculturist. Ownership of land has nothing to do with membership of an FPO. So if you are facing that problem, please raise it at the level of either the district agricultural officer or to the local state government, and they will intervene to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, in most tribal areas, there are very poor land records or no land records. But there are dozens and dozens of tribal uh, FPOs which have been formed in the country. So this should not be an issue at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next question we can take uh, by Mr. Prashant Kage. Most or all FPOs are not doing any kind of processing of the aggregated has harvest as per required quality of the buyers. To create market linkage for these FPOs, this, com this is coming as a major challenge. As per you, what is the best way to address the first level processing challenges? So when you say first level processing, I think you mean at least grading, cleaning of the produce yes, because we are talking about bulk, yes. bulk produce. We are not talking about conversion. So you're not saying that the FPO should convert wheat into atta or paddy into rice. That's beyond the capability at the local level, right? Um, now it's the chicken and egg. How will the FPO do that without access to funding to, let us say, put up a cleaning grading plant, a mechanized cleaner grader? Can we help the FPO? Today, there is, as you know, at the national level, there is a scheme called the Agriculture Infrastructure Fund. It's completely online. And um, any of the enterprises uh, working with FPOs, uh, or if there are even FPO members who are, or you know, NGOs working with FPOs are present here, I would suggest that you should visit that website and see if you can apply because there's a 30% grant or subsidy, right? For infrastructure for FPOs. And I would say a go down with a cleaner grader should be an essential requirement for you know, any farm-based enterprise if you want to enter into the value uh, sort of game so that at least you are then able to target buyers who are seeking quality produce. Right. But um, I want to, you know, also add here that value addition in farm produce cannot start only after the harvest. All over the world, the quality assurance in agri produce has to start during the process of cultivation. Most of the enterprises that we are, you know, meeting um, and who are seeking solutions like this, they try to address this issue after the produce has been harvested. But actually a lot of the damage is already done by them. For example, you can say onions, okay? Do you know that in India, when onions are stored after the Ravi harvest, I uh, saw in the list of attendees, my dear colleague Sudhir Goel, veteran uh, civil servant of Maharashtra who did so much work. He was agriculture commissioner. He was uh, also a district chief secretary in agriculture, he's still associated with agriculture. He will tell you in his state that the, you know, which is the number one onion producing state, the wastage in the stored onion is almost 30%. So one third of the onion that we are producing, we are simply wasting, right? Internationally, the wastage in onion, stored onion is 5%, just five. We are six times the international average. Why is that so? Simply because of the way we harvest and store the onions. Even if we were to create very modern storage uh, infrastructure, we would still not achieve 5% because actually the, to achieve 5%, you have to start doing things from the field itself, from the way you cultivate, from the way you harvest, from the way you dry them and then store them. So is anybody willing to work in the entire what is called value chain? We have very few FPOs working in the entire crop value chain from production to storage. And I would uh, hope that some of the enterprises, startups present today will be incentivized and come forward, especially youngsters. And that's one area where technology can actually be a very major player. But yes, how do we take that technology to the farmer? How do we customize it to Indian conditions? How do we solve uh, it in a way that farmers can see 
a delta of additional income flowing out of that effort. That's the challenge of it. Yeah. Next, please. Uh, thank, you, sir. thank you, sir. So next, we can take the question of Mr. Sushil Sheikh. Okay. Sir, you mentioned you are not uh, to invest in infrastructure. Can there be a model where startups can lead the infrastructure building? Lack of infrastructure is leading role for failure in agriculture ecosystem. So what are your thoughts on this? Now, obviously, we can't expect FPOs to be able to afford very high cost infrastructure. Why? Because FPOs will be always constrained on the amount of capital that they can deploy. Their balance sheet cannot have high levels of equity. They cannot get outside equity because the law is such that you know, private equity cannot flow into uh, FPOs. Therefore, startups in agriculture will have to come forward and share some of that risk. As I said earlier, they will have to deploy models where you either lease in, okay, you either lease in equipment, you lease in infrastructure, and you make it available to the FPO on a sort of rental basis. These are solutions that are likely to work, but expecting upfront you know, capital to be sunk by the FPO, even through loans, beyond a point that will become unsustainable. Yeah. Thank Next. you, sir. We can take a couple more questions before we end the session, sir. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what uh, from G Ganga DS, sir, there are huge number of challenges regarding post harvest integration due to pre-existing marketing channels. How to tackle this? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can give a sort of a short answer to that. That's very where innovation is called for. I'm saying, do we have in this country, we've heard of so many so-called marketing portals being developed, but honestly, without saying this negatively about anybody, why can't we pick up one crop in one territory? I'm not even talking about pan-India or even pan-state. Can somebody develop a portal where the produce held by FPOs in different parts of even one state can be displayed to buyers from outside that state. I'm not saying that we will have marketing relationships, but simply as information, simply as information. And then let's see if we can attract buyers. What buyers will ask the question, what is the value? What is the value to me, right? Is somebody, is there a third party guaranteeing the quantity and the quality? Because let us say I'm sitting in Delhi. I want to buy a produce from a district in Orissa. I want to buy maize in Nabrangpur. Somebody is writing that I've done this book my crop. I'd like to see that. But I'm saying, is there a guarantee that I as a buyer have sitting in Delhi that this product is actually held in this quantity? And of this quality, not because the FPO says so, or because the startup says so, because a third party who I, who both of us trust says so, right? Can we have a simply an information portal? I don't want to call it a marketing portal. I know the law today does not allow this kind of marketing portal to come up, but I would say that we need to, we need to look at uh, solutions like that and we need to test them in a limited geography and then we can upscale. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, sir. So we have a uh, quite a lot of questions. We will uh, show you that we will answer and get back to you. But before ending the session, we can take one last question. Uh, question is by Mr. Shishesh Shinde. Majority FPUs are focused on revenue from trading, processing and input selling, while which falls under either demand and supply aggregation. For technology focused on improving agriculture practices and produce quality, tech-based services are difficult to introduce for FPUs, since value is relative, re relative here, varying from farmer to farmer. So uh, would you share your thoughts on this? See, this is the, I, I think that the comment is made in a, shall we say, critical uh, manner that FPUs are only doing input selling, they are aggregating produce. And I'm saying, uh, why is that objectionable? The FPO, is not a production entity, right? 
the members of the FPO are producers. But the FPO actually is the motivation for the farmers to have uh, a formal enterprise is to be able to access inputs at a lower cost, which is what happens the minute 100, even 100 farmers come together and now they are buying seed or other inputs, the local dealer will give them a discount. Many FPOs we know have tied up with manufacturers, they've got licenses. Uh, I see nothing wrong with that. They are simply, you know, building a business, okay? Aggregation of produce, definitely. It is a trading entity. It's an input supplying entity. Some FPOs have even got into sourcing bulk loans and on lending to the members. Perfectly legitimate. Because these are the business activities which individual farmers cannot do. These are the business and uh, business activities which only an enterprise can do. So good for them. Yes, there are also FPOs who have put up juice making plants or pulping plants or zira processing in Gujarat, I have seen. So depending on the local priority and the decision of the members, they can go in the direction they want to. I don't think that we should look at this in a negative way that maybe the only opportunity that is available to them is trading. So they are tapping that opportunity. We know that capital is still a major problem. I'll just leave one statistic with everybody. Do you know that in the last, shall we say, six years, the total amount of working capital loans to the FPO sector as a whole, as a whole I'm talking about, is around 1,200 crores. 1,200 crores. That's it. To these 30,000 FPOs. The share of Samunati alone, the share of Samunati alone is 400 crores. Okay? Out of this 1,200 crores. Another 300 crores is by other NBFCs. And the rest is divided between the public sector, banks, etc. So I'm saying, where is the capital which has been made available to the FPOs? We cannot criticize the FPOs when we are not even willing to make sufficient working capital available to them. There are so many challenges. Banks say minimum three years balance sheet is necessary. What is he going to do for three years? Then he has to come to the likes of Samunati and other NBFCs. Then the criticism is, oh, but your loans are too expensive. But to make him eligible for that bank loan, he needs a credit history. We are very happy to say that 70% plus of our FPO partners had Samunati as the first lend lender. And that the second lender was a public sector bank. So that means that the credit history that we helped the FPO to create attracted a public sector lender and brought the cost of capital. We're very happy for that. Okay. So before we you know, criticize them for this, let's first solve, I would say, those three problems. I'll close with that. Let's get them capital. Let's get them access to technology. Let's get them markets. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to this wonderful you, group. Sir. And I look forward to engaging again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Now I call upon Mr. B. Gobalakrishnan for the closing remarks. Thank you very much, sir. Even even um, uh, some of your uh, points, the agriculture is a factory without a roof. A fabulous point because it is also reflected uh, how it has been imagined. And you you narrated the agriculture with the football because it has got four sides. And what are the four sides of the crisis which is available in the, uh, the core crisis of uh, agriculture? And you also walk through what are the agriculture needs, the capital, market, and tech which is needed. Then what are the context of uh, agriculture? I think it is a it is a very nice point. And uh, finally, there is one comparison you said it has to be anything in agriculture. It has to be technology enabled, not technology led. I think I think uh, uh, people like me because we came from uh, technology led enterprises like it's here. So so we are also understanding. I'm also understanding the nuances. And uh, and finally, you said. The three words in uh, English, it should be used often. If I don't know, I should say that, okay, I don't know. Thereby, there will be a learning attitude which is coming for the startups and the FPOs. And there will be very context specific because most of the time we are getting into uh, something which is irrelevant. We should be very context specific. 
and uh, the agility is a key and uh, anything which you create it has to be asset light because of this word i i, I often uh, inform the uh, startups in a larger way because most of the time they always say that sir i create this one for which i need the funds but as you said rightly we i am also uh, working with the vcs and uh, angels for a long time and the understanding of the agriculture per se for uh, the vcs are very very limited i 100% agree and uh, and some of your words are really uh, uh, useful for the startups and the fpo whoever is listening there are about 90 plus people they logged in and definitely it is going to benefit uh, most of the people here so 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 as as uh, normally the takeaways are uh, there is a learning then you apply the learning so that you can accelerate and uh, and and attitude is very very crucial because whenever we talk about win big with the dreams attitude is very very crucial as uh, uh, pravesh ji also talked about be yourself and have a curiosity so that you continuously learn more and apply so that you will go to the next curve and just to talk about uh, this one because uh, we are also completing the fifth session and the next session on the product building will start after some time so as as uh, it has been narrated we are we have a platform called samaram in which uh, there are roughly around 145 crores of uh, uh, debt which has been given to the startup so any greenfield uh, startups who wants they can also go to the site and give your uh, kycs and you can also apply uh, to the site directly and if i want to reach out to startup at samandhi.com reach out to her so that we can also uh send it to the people and uh, there is one more opportunity which is available for some of the fpos uh with some of the startups or in the rural area you wanted to become an associate for samanadi this is a great opportunity which is available there is a portal which is uh, available you can represent some of our portfolios in the rural areas and you can also pass on to this information so that we'll come back to you with more services for uh, this one so so you reach out to startup at samnadi.com and uh, once again thank you very much for uh, I, i really feel uh, uh, a lot of knowledge because we would have called you many times and this is a starting session and we will be disturbing you more specifically for some of the value chains in future uh, because this will be very useful for the fpos and the startups and uh, i am very sure that this will be very very helpful for the startups and and the fpos who are participated today over to anup thank you thank you mr bg for your precise briefing this is the last session of phase 1 of samunati master class series post which we will be launching samunati master class series phase 2 further details will be announced through our social media platform hoping to engage with you in the future now i call upon ms geetanjali to propose the vote of thanks of the event hello all thank you for joining the session today and a special thank you to mr pravesh sharma for sharing his knowledge and insights i'm very certain that uh, this session will be a very enlightening for the budding entrepreneurs agripreneurs and all the agri tech and food tech startups that has joined today and i would like to uh, I, I, <coughs> i would like to let um, let know my gratitude to all the pool of incubators our innovators because without them this session wouldn't have been possible as my colleague mr An ms anupriya said that the phase 2 session will be announced in a social media handle so 